Okay, uh, let us continue with our lecture from the morning. We ended at the point where we discussed and uh, wrote down the standard model Lagrangian and we have discussed that all terms in it are gauge invariant, all terms in it are operators of dimension 4 or less. In fact, all of them are exactly dimension 4 except for the Higgs mass term and um, now we come to the first, I think the first miracle of the standard model and by miracles I mean properties of the standard model which are not part of the definition of the standard model because the definition contains the field content and the gauge transformations um, but which follow immediately from the definition of the standard model and uh, even though they were not put in they are accidentally very fundamental properties of the standard model which happen to agree with experiment and that sheds a very important and interesting light on the validity of the standard model and the first such miracle comes directly from the Lagrangian namely we have automatic baryon and lepton number conservation So, the observation is simply that there exists no gauge invariant term which you can write down with the fields of the standard model which is dimension 4 or less. and that is simply an observational fact you can try whatever you want you cannot combine all the fields that are present in the standard model in a way such that you do not ruin one of those properties um, but violate baryon or lepton number and uh, if you go away from any of those conditions then you can write down baryon or lepton number conserving terms uh, violating terms for example if you allow dimension bigger than 4, dimension 5 or dimension 6 operators then you can write down baryon and lepton number violating terms and that is one of your exercises to uh, figure out how such terms could look like for example there are terms corresponding to Majorana neutrino masses such that the neutrinos become equal to their own antiparticles and you can get neutrinoless double beta decay which is important here in Dresden because that is searched for experimentally that corresponds to a dimension 5 operator and on the dimension 6 level you can write down many more terms which violate baryon number and or lepton number similarly if you remain at dimension 4 but you have beyond the standard model fields for example supersymmetry super partners of the leptons, sleptons and squarks and gay genos and hexenos then you can write down dimension 4 terms which also violate baryon or lepton number but in the standard model you cannot and uh, that simply follows accidentally uh, as you see from the examples it follows accidentally from the particular field content of the standard model And when I say accidentally, that means that we did not construct the standard model specifically to achieve baryon or lepton number conservation. It was not a condition. Only gauge invariance was the condition. And baryon and lepton number is an output. And of course, uh, surprisingly, uh, this uh, baryon and lepton number conservation agrees with experiment because there we have not observed baryon number violation or lepton number violating processes and therefore it's a miraculous but very important property of the standard model ok so let's just say this becomes different with uh, dimension 6 
or five and four PSM. PSM stands for a beyond the standard model. For example, supersymmetry means Okay, so this, uh, yeah. So is it possible to summarize why um, these dimension 6, 5 or higher um, operators are not treated as a bit, but dimension 4 and the low R? The well, it's the general renormalization theory which guarantees uh, this. Uh, or in other words, it guarantees that if you have only dimension 4 or less, then at higher orders the divergences have a structure which uh, corresponds to singularities which can be cancelled by certain counterterms and those counterterms correspond again to dimension 4 or less operators in the Lagrangian. And uh, the very simple way to understand it is uh, from looking at the prefactors. The prefactors of dimension 4 or less um, are either dimensionless or contain positive powers of the mass. And uh, therefore, if you look at the prefactors of divergences, they again uh, are consisting of products of the coupling constants of the Lagrangian. Um, many, many coupling constants maybe, but if you only have dimension positive coupling constants, no matter how many of them you multiply, it always remains a positive dimensionality coupling constant and therefore uh, this is an easy way to see uh, this power counting criterion for the divergences. In the opposite case, let's suppose you have one operator where the coupling constant has dimension 1 over mass, then you have Feynman diagrams with two such vertices, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 such vertices, then uh, the product of the coupling constants adds up to something with arbitrarily low dimensionality and to compensate the corresponding divergence you need uh, operators with higher and higher dimension. So you said that um, these dimension 6 operators, they correspond to this Zepton or Valium number? Can correspond. can correspond. Not all of them, but you can write down some. So what exactly is the search? So the search theoretically is for higher dimension operators which violate this or which don't violate? In your exercise, you are supposed to search for some dimension 6 operators which violate baryon or lepton number in order to convince yourself of this statement. The, ex the experiment says that this baryon number is always conserved, so, I mean, so the research is looking for many violations, or is it experimentally so profound that there cannot be a process which violates? You mean beyond the exercise uh, experiments which are done currently? So of course, uh, the, uh, experiments always search for effects that go beyond the standard model. And I'm telling you this, this is an accidental property of the standard model. Therefore, it is absolutely worthwhile to search experimentally for violations of this, um, which could then uh, be described by, for example, uh, beyond the standard model particles or fields like supersymmetry or by higher dimensional operators. And uh, therefore, it is important to know which properties of the standard model exist. And uh, I'm, as I said, I always want to uh, make you aware which property of the standard model leads to which consequence such that if an experiment observes something, you know which corners of the standard model to change. Okay. Yes, so it's a, a theoretically it follows accidentally? Therefore it is not profound. It is not profound in, in other theories which are equally uh, well gauge theories and equally uh, well perfectly fundamentally um, good quantum field theories. You could have a barrier number violation and lepton number violation. So it's not a deep principle that a theory must preserve baryon and lepton number. Uh, it is just an accidental property of the particular theory, which is our standard model. And however, this property agrees with experiment. And so this um, could tell you either that it's likely in a way that some, uh, at some point experiments will find a violation because it is nothing particularly deep or 
uh, there is no barrier number violation in the universe and uh, that means the standard model is actually better than we thought it is when we invented it. And uh, the same statement can be made for all the other miracles that will follow. Actually, um, I will not write down any text for this, but um, the standard model does violate baryon and lepton number, but not in Feynman diagrams, not perturbatively, but via non-perturbative effects, uh, which you cannot calculate from Feynman rules. Baryon and lepton number is violated, that is a known effect, but it has not yet been observed experimentally, but theoretically the calculations exist and uh, what the impact of that would be is that in the early universe, in phase transitions in the cosmos, baryon and lepton number probably have been violated at some stage of the universe development. Um, and one question that is also uh, discussed a lot in current research is, is that baryon number violation that is predicted in the standard model non-perturbatively enough? to generate the observed baryon anti baryon asymmetry in the universe. And as far as we know, it is not enough. So in order to explain that observation, we need physics beyond the standard model. So for all these reasons, uh, this is an important topic. Okay, uh, let's go to the next topic. The gauge boson fermion interactions. And here I want to directly write down a statement, uh, namely, if you only look at gauge invariance under SU2F cross U1 hypercharge, and you know nothing but uh, this gauge invariance, then you can already define gauge fields for the photon, for the Z boson and for the W plus minus bosons which have the interactions uh, of exactly the kind that we discussed in the morning in this phenomenological introduction. The structure of the interactions is like in this phenomenological discussion where we parameterized all the different interactions with different weak mixing angles S theta Z, S theta W and so on and the prediction is S theta W is exactly equal to S theta Z is exactly equal to that so called effective weak mixing angle and uh, they will now all be commonly denoted as just S theta with one argument uh, theta and that is true for all fermions. So there is just one weak mixing angle, as I said, which comes now from theory and the theory predicts that all those experimentally defined mixing angles are equal to that single theory mixing angle and that is even true for all of the different fermions. So we have a universality and that is true at tree level. Remember we are in a section on tree level results. And in addition, we have some relationships, um, namely the tangent of this uh, angle theta is given by the ratio of the two gauge couplings GY divided by GW and the electric charge E, which appears in the photon and all the other interactions, is defined or is related uh, as GW times S theta, and that is also the same as GY times cosine theta, uh, according to that formula, and all of this is equal to the following GW times GY divided by square root GW square 
plus g y square. So from the two gauge couplings in our electroweak theory, we can construct a weak mixing angle. As I said in the morning, this is now defined via the two gauge couplings, namely the ratio of gauge couplings gives the tangent of the weak mixing angle. Then we can define the electric charge also using such a trigonometric formula and then all the other mixing angles which uh, are defined in the morning are equal to this single one. And all of that follows only uh, if you know the gauge structure. You do not have to know anything about the Higgs sectoral structure. The Higgs doesn't enter this. And remember or note the masses of W and Z also do not enter this discussion here. So we do not yet know anything about the masses. We only know about the uh, fields and particles, but not about their mass. But we know something about their interactions with fermions. We know exactly this. And so let us now establish this. How can we establish this property? We need to analyze the covariant derivative because the covariant derivative is the one which contains the interactions between gauge bosons and matter fields. And so by analyzing the covariant derivative, we will um, get a hold on all these various interactions. So we just need to evaluate the covariant derivative, for example, acting on the left-handed lepton doublet, but we could do the calculation also for any other fermion multiplet. But let's be specific to make it a little bit uh, more transparent. So the covariant derivative, capital DVU, acting on the left-handed lepton doublet, acts as follows. So we have the ordinary derivative plus i times, and then we have all uh, the electroweak gauge interactions. We have GW times TA WA mu plus GY hypercharge times G mu times the left handed lepton doublet. Okay, and now in order to exhibit uh, interactions with W, Z, and photon, we need to make new linear combinations between the four gauge fields, uh, such linear combinations that one linear combination corresponds to a photon, another linear combination corresponds to the Z, and some linear combinations to the W plus minus. And I will immediately write down the correct linear combinations. First of all, for uh, the W's, it's particularly simple. So W plus minus mu is defined as linear combinations of the W1 and 2, like follows. W1 mu minus or plus i times W2 mu. And note here, plus minus, minus plus. So this is a linear combination which preserves the norm, basically orthogonal um, rotation. And similarly, we do it for the photon and the Z. So photon A mu and Z mu is defined by an orthogonal matrix times B and W3. And the orthogonal matrix contains the weak mixing angle by definition, cosine theta, and then uh, plus sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. This is first of all a definition and we have not yet fixed which mixing angle we choose. But let us plug in this definition of linear combinations into the covariant derivative and um, analyze it and interpret the corresponding results. So then obviously we only need to look at the square brackets. So the square brackets now become the following. Um, by the way, I mean, have you seen this calculation already many times or, yeah? I saw, I saw this co combination, yes, but uh, I mean, uh, in a little bit different context, um, when you have the Higgs and then spontaneous symmetry breaking, I always thought of this as the uh, mass eigenstate. 
Um, the motivation would be maybe to uh, introduce um, eigenstates of gauge fields which have particular interactions. Particular interactions, so the motivation would be, and uh, that comes next, to introduce one gauge field, namely the photon, which couples proportionally to the electric charge. And generally, uh, then to do all the other fields in with suitable orthogonal relationships. So the first thing that you can define unambiguously is you want that this field here has a coupling proportional to Q, the electric charge. And what I will say, we will need to write down in a few moments anyway. And then the Z is whatever is necessary to make this an orthogonal transformation in order to preserve the norm of the fields. And after you know that, then you can also motivate to say, I want also some fields which are eigenstates of the electric charge. And uh, those individually are not eigenstates of the electric charge, but those are, and therefore it's also motivated to introduce them. So that would be the motivation we think of the interactions and uh, mainly, primarily, focus on electromagnetism. Uh, we want to introduce the photon and everything else uh, follows from that. And we do not yet know whether those are mass eigenstates or not. That has to come from the Higgs sector, as you said. Um, but we can already prove at this point that the interactions match observation. Um, but of course, this is only a meaningful statement if they are at the same time also mass eigenstates with the correct mass. But anyway, this is already important to know. In the spirit of what I said before, I want you to know what follows from what. And this interaction behavior follows only from gauge invariance and has nothing to do with the Higgs sector. So let's do the calculation very quickly. I assume you have seen similar calculations before. So we just plug it in. GW, then uh, let's say we have T1 uh, times uh, what, is, what is now um, W1 in terms of W plus minus. It is W plus plus W minus divided by square root of 2 mu, then plus GW T2, then uh, W1 minus W2 divided by square root of 2 times i uh, mu um, w1 divided by i minus plus and then plus gw t3 times uh, w3 and w3 is the inverse transformation so that would be sine b mu plus cosine w3 mu, and finally plus gy hypercharge times b mu, and b mu is the inverse transformation cosine, uh, sorry, uh, that is of course the inverse transformation sine of a mu plus cosine of z mu, and here uh, b mu is the inverse transformation cosine times the photon minus sine times the z. So this is uh, just plugging in the definitions and now we sort according to the fields. So we have w plus mu times what? w plus mu times gw times T1 over square root of 2 minus T2 over i times square root of 2. So we have T1 plus i times T2 divided by square root of 2 plus GW times W minus mu correspondingly T1 minus i T2 divided by square root of 2. Then we have something proportional to the photon. Now it becomes particularly interesting. What are the terms proportional to the photon field? We have here uh, sine GW T3 and here plus cosine GY times hypercharge. That is our prefactor of the photon. 
and finally z mu times what? So we have here z mu times cosine theta gw g3 minus uh, sine theta gy times hypercharge. Okay. That is our square bracket corresponding to the interaction terms uh, resulting from covariant derivatives. Mm, how does that work? So now let us uh, look at the AMU terms in particular. The AMU terms are given here, so sine theta gw t3 cosine theta gy times y. And now we impose the uh, condition that Jonas just mentioned, namely we want that the photon couples proportionally to the electric charge. That is the defining condition on how we define the mixing angle. So we, it is desired that uh, the photon couples proportionally to Q, which we wanted to define as T3 plus hypercharge. So we want that that object, which is in the bracket sine theta gw t3 plus cosine theta gy times y, that should be proportional to q. How is it possible that this object is proportional to t3 plus hypercharge? How is that possible? It is only possible if this prefactor is equal to the other prefactor. The two prefactors must be equal. If they are equal, then the whole expression is some common prefactor times the electric charge. That is the condition. So in order to fulfill the condition that the photon couples proportionally to Q, we must choose the mixing angle such that these two prefactors become equal. Then our condition is met. And that means that the tangent of the mixing angle is defined by the ratio of the two gauge couplings. So this condition is equivalent to saying that the photon couples proportionally to the electric charge. Then uh, the photon interaction is actually um, exactly not proportional, but it is exactly equal to it is exactly equal to. Uh, the electric charge unit or QED gauge coupling times Q if we also choose that P e is equal to that prefactor, namely equal to sine theta times GW or also equal to cosine theta times GY. And since the sine theta um, is given by uh, this relationship here, that means that this is equal to GW times GY divided by the square root. Okay. So then we have derived both two expressions here from the requirement that the photon couples proportionally to the electric charge. And if we set the electric charge unit E to that value, then uh, the interaction strength totally is exactly the one which uh, came from our discussion in the morning. So the QED Feynman rule is completely reproduced, including all prefactors. So this reproduces QED Feynman rule, let's say. And the, um, let's say, expression 
in section 1.1, this phenomenological section from this morning. So then the first statement is verified. First of all, we must set the couplings to these values and then the photon has the correct interaction in agreement with the discussion of this morning. And then everything is fixed and now what uh, remains to be done is to calculate now unambiguously the resulting interactions of the Z boson and the W boson and to verify that they indeed correspond also to the results from the morning with these uh, all equal universal mixing angles. So in order to do that we must look at the set new terms. So the set new terms they are now the following cosine theta gw times t3 minus sine theta ty times hypercharge. Just plugging in uh, we can now express everything in terms of the QED gauge coupling E and uh, then we have cosine theta GW is now E divided by S theta okay, times T3 minus sine theta and GY is given by E divided by cosine theta times Y and uh, instead of Y we can always write um, the solution of this uh, relationship uh, T3 plus Y is Q, so Y is T3 minus Q. So that is the hypercharge. Uh, sorry, the opposite. Q minus T3. And then we can um, collect a little bit. So we have here, let's bring it to this form, E divided by S theta C theta. And then we have here cosine square times T3 and here plus another sine theta square times T3 and then minus sine theta square times Q and uh, simply speaking we have just T3 minus sine square times Q. That is the interaction of the set boson in general. Actually, I, I started with saying we evaluated applied to the lepton doublet, but we have not put in anything specific for the lepton doublet. This is completely generally true. Whatever you apply the covariant derivative onto. So this is uh, the nicest form that we can achieve for the Z boson interactions in general. Now we can look at the Z fermion fermion interactions specifically to connect uh, to the phenomenology discussion in the morning because there we have in fact left handed fermions and right handed fermions. And then we can really look at this uh, combination here we have the left handed fermion bar times covariant derivative times the left handed fermion plus the same thing for the right handed and we only look at the set mu terms from, from that structure and then this gives uh, from the left handed part we have FL bar times I times then this exact expression but plugging in now really the values of uh, all these quantum numbers corresponding to the left handed fermion. So we have I times E S theta cosine theta times T3 corresponding to the left handed fermion minus Q corresponding to the left handed fermion times sine square theta that comes from the left handed part and okay gamma mu was missing gamma mu and uh, then left handed fermion plus the same for the right handed gamma mu i and here z mu e s theta cosine theta 
Now the same for the right-handed fermion. For the right-handed fermion, the T3 is always zero in the standard model because the right-handed fermions are all singlets under SU2. T3 stands for the SU2 generator, so that is zero for the right-handed fermions. And then we have here minus Q F right-handed times sine square theta times Z mu times the right-handed fermion. Okay. And so this can be combined. Let's combine it. Uh, left and right can be uh, used, uh, combined by using gamma 5. So we just have F bar left and F on the right. And in between we have gamma mu i times a common prefactor S theta cosine theta. And now let's say um, this T3 FL is the isospin, the weak isospin of the left-handed fermion. And in the morning we abbreviated this as I3F. So I3F stands for the weak isospin of the fermion as a whole, but this is meant to be the T3 eigenvalue for the left-handed part of the fermion. The right-handed fermion has always T3 equals zero. So that would be this. And uh, then we have minus Q, F, of course, the left-handed and the right-handed fermions have the same electric charge, so we have just QF times sine theta square, and all of that comes with the left-handed projector, uh, because that applies to the left-handed fermion, and for the right-handed, we simply have this additional term with the same prefactor, minus QF S theta square times the right-handed projector. And then you see the general set boson fermion fermion interaction here explicitly as a term in the Lagrangian from which you can directly read off the Feynman rule. And then you have here a coefficient, basically a quantum number coefficient in front of the left-handed projector. You can call this CFL, the left-handed coefficient, and here you have C uh, F R, the coefficient in front of the right-handed projector. And overall, you have this coupling constant prefactor E divided by S theta cosine theta. So that is the general fermion expression, and so this can now be rewritten. So this is either uh, C L F P L plus C uh, R F PR, where these two coefficients have the values that you can see. But equivalently, you can also write it as the following, namely you can write it as a term proportional to the unit matrix, namely what is proportional to the unit matrix CLF plus CRF divided by 2 times the unit matrix minus gamma 5 times the following, namely times what? CLF minus CRF divided by 2. Okay. And then uh, if you look at the combinations, then the sum of the two is the isospin minus 2 times the charge times SW square. And that corresponds exactly to the prediction in the morning. And the difference uh, is just the uh, isospin I3 which also corresponds to what we had in the morning. Therefore, this agrees with the structure in section 1.1, as was the claim. So this prefactor is reproduced, of course, with S theta instead of the variable S theta z from before. And also here we have the sine theta in the morning that was called the effective weak mixing angle sine theta effective, which is now predicted to be equal to, again, the same sine theta. Let's also look at the W. The W plus minus terms, there is not much to say. They are simply here, for example, W plus minus GW uh, over square root of two 
times W plus mu times T1 plus I times T2 divided by, what is it? Oh, sorry. Nothing. Just like that. Plus the analogous. And if you plug in um, the expression for um, doublets, The expression for doublets would be that this is one half the Pauli matrix sigma 1 plus i times Pauli matrix sigma 2. And the Pauli matrix sigma 1 is this 0, 1, 1, 0. That is 0 minus i, i is 0. So this particular sum for doublets is exactly the following. Dw divided by square root of 2 times w plus times the following matrix 0, 1, 0, 0. And uh, then you see that exactly that reproduces again what we had in the morning. Namely, uh, this applies now to a fermion doublet, for example, down quark, up quark. It means that a down quark interacts via the W plus uh, with an up quark. And the interaction strength is given by GW over square root of 2. GW is E divided by S theta, which was exactly again the prediction of the morning. So this also agrees with section 1.1. One, one. And in this way, we have established everything that we claimed. And as a byproduct, you have also seen how you can manipulate such covariant derivatives and how you can go from one field basis to a new field basis by doing such linear combinations and how you obtain interactions um, for a new basis in fields by simply plugging in the relationships into the Lagrangian and expressing the Lagrangian in terms of the new set of fields. That is what we have done. And then you can read off the interactions and Feynman rules in the usual way. And I stress again, which was implicit in the statement that I made in the beginning, so I said, all of this follows only from the gauge group. Therefore, all these results are the same in all theories with that gauge group, not only in the standard model. So therefore, the identical calculation also applies to uh, BSM with the same gauge group. For example, there is the so-called two Higgs doublet model, where you have not one Higgs doublet, but two Higgs doublets, which has, however, the same gauge group. And so the identical calculation applies. For the minimal supersymmetric standard model has the same gauge group, but different meta field content, and so on. And for all those uh, models, you get the same result. Namely, at three level, you can identify the photon, Z boson, and W plus minus. In exactly this way, you can define the electric charge and the weak fixing angle in exactly the same way. And you always get the same results for the interactions. But it would be different in models where the gauge group is different. So what models are these? Models with extra gauge bosons, because then the gauge group must be modified. So Z prime models, etc. Z prime stands for a new neutral gauge boson which would be described by an extra gauge group, like an extra U1 factor in the gauge group, then uh, that calculation might have to be modified. So as a final um, result, we can write down the covariant derivative. In these physical fields, let's say, So this is now independent of the lepton doublet or anything else. 
you see again on the left blackboard the original covariant derivative in terms of the interaction eigenstate fields W A and B mu. Now we can rewrite the same by just replacing the W's and B's by the new fields photon Z and W plus minus and by using those relationships for the weak mixing angle and for the electric charge. And so then we obtain normal DMU plus I times and then in the square bracket we have according to our calculation E times Q times the photon where Q is this T3 plus Y. This has, is now an output of the calculation plus something proportional to the Z and this is our Z boson term. So the coefficient of Z is exactly this. So we can copy that formula. E divided by S theta C theta times T3 minus Q times S theta square times Z mu. So it's a little bit uh, awkward looking coefficient, which is not so easy to recognize or remember. And then we have W and um, plus minus, namely T divided by S theta times square root of 2 times W plus mu times T plus plus W minus mu T minus, where in the last equation I use double T plus minus is defined as T1 plus minus I times T2. So here plus minus plus minus corresponds to each other. And that is obviously a very nice and useful form for the covariant derivative from which you can then read off very nicely all the interactions between all gauge bosons and uh, any matter field, fermions but also Higgs field interactions. And this is independently of what it acts on. I have given you the recipe. Uh, what are the values of T3 and Q for all the various fields, like Pauli matrix or zero or maybe something else? And uh, so you can now know and reconstruct uh, the covariant derivative of all objects in the standard model. Good. That ends our first physics discussion, namely of the interactions of the gauge bosons with fields. Now we come to the next big topic, which is the Higgs sector and spontaneous electroweak symmetry breaking. Any questions to this first? Well, interaction, I just state in the obvious and naive sense that these were the original fields introduced uh, along with the gauge group. So the gauge group SU2 requires three gauge fields, W1, 2, 3, and uh, I call them the interaction eigenstates corresponding to the SU2 gauge group, and similarly B mu is the gauge field corresponding to the U1 gauge group. Um, so it is not directly an eigenstate under some other operator. Um, yeah. Sure, the BMU is also an eigenstate under electric charge because it has charge zero, but that is not the point. The point is that these are really the original fields uh, from the gauge um, structure, and then we introduce linear combinations to make them more physical. And uh, ultimately, as you mentioned already before, those will also become mass eigenstates. However, we don't know that yet, and it is actually not uh, obvious, and it's also not always true. So, as I said, the gauge group guarantees that you can write down this, but it is not guaranteed that those fields are mass eigenstates. This depends on the structure of the Higgs potential. It's not always true.
So in a way, another miracle of the standard model that uh, the photon defined in this way is automatically also a mass eigenstate, similarly for the Z. Okay, let us move to some maybe less obvious uh, points, even though probably they are still more or less obvious and well known to you, I suppose. So, spontaneous symmetry breaking. And masses. I want to begin with a direct calculation without much fuss and many comments because I'm sure you are familiar with this kind of calculation anyway. So let us look at the Higgs potential V of phi which was minus mu square times phi square plus lambda times phi to the fourth and we assume mu square and lambda to be positive. If mu square and lambda are positive, then the shape of the potential is like this. It's a wine bottle potential or Mexican head potential. And it's a potential in a four-dimensional space, namely phi is a two-component complex quantity. So it has four real components and we take the absolute square of those four real components. So the whole thing depends only on the sum of the squares of the four real components of the Higgs potential. I cannot draw a five-dimensional potential, but I can sketch here uh, something which depends on two components of phi. Let's say like the real part of phi one of those components and the imaginary part of one of those components, but it would li look like the same for all four um, components. And then this is the potential as a function of the real and imaginary part of phi. Okay, and it has this wine bottle potential form. So therefore, the minimum of the potential is not at the symmetric point at the origin, but uh, there are infinitely many degenerate minima which are at points localized away from the origin. And uh, those infinitely many degenerate minima, they are connected by in principle symmetry transformations because the symmetry guarantees that the potential does not depend on all the individual components, but the potential must be SU2 cross U1 symmetric. And therefore, it depends only on a combination of them, and you can do a symmetry transformation of one point away from the origin and get a different point where the potential has the same value because of the symmetry. And so therefore, since the symmetry is continuous, we get infinitely many degenerate minima. And this uh, flat direction here in the potential corresponds to the direction that you can obtain by performing a symmetry transformation of one example minimum. So these degenerate minima are, each of them is at an unsymmetric point. But of course, the curve here, the uh, set of all minima, basically describes a manifold in this space here. And the manifold as such, as a whole, is of course symmetric. But each point on it is not symmetric at unsymmetric points. And uh, what else? All of them are connected by symmetry transformations. Okay, and that is the sign of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Spontaneous symmetry breaking is the breaking of a symmetry which is not really a breaking at all, but the symmetry is present. 
However, the ground state of the theory is at an unsymmetric point and therefore small excitations away from the ground state do not feel the full symmetry or the symmetry is reflected in different ways than uh, seeing just um, all orientations equally. Okay, let us calculate the position of the minimum by taking the first derivative of V. The simplest thing is to take a derivative with respect to phi square, because actually it depends only on phi square, then the derivative is minus mu square plus two lambda times phi square, and this derivative must be zero. Therefore, the minimum satisfies phi minimum square is equal to such that this is zero, so it means phi minimum square is equal to mu square divided by two lambda. So if we have uh, found this manifold of all possible minima, we can make one particular choice where we choose our uh, minimum of the theory to be and then we study small fluctuations around that particular chosen minimum and we choose here phi minimum is equal to zero v divided by square root of two. So we choose by hand that the minimum has a particular orientation, namely the upper component of the doublet is zero and the lower component is not zero but it is real. So three out of the four real components are set to zero and one of the four real components is set to a non-zero value. So it's like in the sketch we are along the real axis of one of those components. And the physics would not change if we would do a different choice because all choices are related by gauge transformations which do not change physics. If this is our choice, let me just write it here, then the v has the value uh, v square. This square root of 2 is of course convention, but it is useful in many calculations and so it's often done. And so in this way, fine minimum square is v square over 2. Therefore, v square is given by u square divided by lambda. Let me also say later we may introduce a more general meaning of V. Okay, just as a warning. It may be that later we allow that V is different from this uh, expression here in order to have a more general description that can be useful for renormalization. And we will see about that later. But for now, at three level, v square is an abbreviation for that ratio here. Okay, so far so good. Uh, that is, of course, well known to you. Um, maybe something that you have not seen so often before might be the following. Namely, what are the gauge transformations of the vacuum? So, let us apply all the generators of gauge transformations onto the vacuum state. What does that mean? We do infinitesimal gauge transformations of the vacuum. Infinitesimal gauge transformations mean a unit matrix plus a generator times a variable. So what is interesting is to apply the generators TA onto the vacuum state. And similarly, the hypercharge generator onto the vacuum state. The outcome of that tells us uh, how infinitesimal SU2 or U1 gauge transformations act onto the vacuum. So let's work it out. So what happens if we apply TA onto phi and do it in the minimum? So TA on phi, do you still know what we have to plug in values for the TA in case of the Higgs doublet? Yep. Yeah. 
right. So Pauli matrix, of course, divided by two uh, times phi mu. Now, the main question is not what it is exactly. The main question is, is it zero or not? Because that will tell us whether the vacuum is invariant under the corresponding transformation or not. So the only question that is really interesting is that zero if our phi min is that for any Pauli matrix. And what is the answer? It's not zero. Because all the Pauli matrices, okay, you know them explicitly, but also it's they are invertible matrices. Therefore, whatever they act on, if that is not a zero vector, you must get a non-zero vector. So this is always non-zero for all A. So similarly, hypercharge, what is the hypercharge acting on the Higgs doublet? Who knows it? That was one half, right? So one half times five min is also not zero. Therefore, out of our four different gauge transformations in SU2 cross U1, individually they are all broken by the vacuum. The vacuum is not invariant under any of them. However, there is one and exactly one linear combination of the four generators which leave the vacuum invariant. And in principle we could now do an equation and ask which linear combination out of the four matrices leaves the vacuum invariant, but we know it because we chose it appropriately. So let's immediately write it down, namely T3 plus hypercharge acting on phi min. What does that give? T3 acting on phi min would be the matrix, let's write it down maybe just uh, for you to be super explicit. T3 is one half times the Pauli matrix sigma 3. So that would be this, right? This acting on phi min and plus the number one half, which is then the unit matrix. Acting on phi min. So in other words, that is this. 1, 0, 0, 0, so that adds up to 0 times this. So now you see it obviously explicitly that this is mapped to 0. So, and this is the generator of electric charge corresponding to the photon interactions. This maps the vacuum to 0, in other words the vacuum is gauge invariant under gauge transformations corresponding to the photon. So the vacuum is not invariant under any individual SU2 transformation or also not under a U1 transformation, but it is invariant under transformations corresponding to the linear combination. And this is what we mean and summarize by the following statement. So the statement that you would use is this. SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge, the gauge invariance is broken down by spontaneous symmetry breaking to U1 corresponding to Q equal T3 plus Y. So the last line is really a shorthand notation for the sentence above it. We have a gauge group and a gauge invariance of the theory and spontaneous symmetry breaking may, means that the symmetry of the vacuum is a symmetry of corresponding to a smaller subgroup and this is the subgroup which leaves the vacuum invariant. And that is what we have established. 
Maybe let me just, in order to save a little bit of time, give some comments. So first of all, uh, different choices of Phi-Min would in principle be possible. So you do not have to choose uh, the minimum value in this way, such that we have a zero here and a real value there, but you could choose any other choice. They lead all to the same physics. Because uh, this corresponds to a gauge transformation and gauge transformations do not change physics. And you can, for example, easily convince yourself at home or whenever you have time, do it yourself. If you do not assume anything except for the fact that phi minimum has uh, absolute value square, which is non-zero, then you can always check that there is precisely one but only one generator which is unbroken. And the unbroken generator always has to form hypercharge plus some linear combination of the TAs and the norm of the coefficient of the TAs adds up to 1. So it doesn't have to be T3, but it can be T1 or T2 or a square root of 2 times T1 plus T2 and so on. Something like that, but uh, it's always, always possible to define unbroken Uh, some coefficient times TA plus hypercharge. And that would simply modify uh, the definition of the photon and Z boson and W plus minus fields. But without loss of generality, our choice is positive. And that is then the justification that I announced of this Q is equal to T3 plus hypercharge, which I noted at the beginning. This is now justified um, as the generator which is unbroken by the vacuum. And then this leads, of course, to a massless photon. So, and here we come to our next miracle of the standard model. Namely, because of the Higgs potential structure that we have seen here, it is automatic that there is exactly one and only one unbroken generator which can be interpreted as the generator of electric charge. So exactly one unbroken generator with properties of the photon or electric charge. And again, this is not true in uh, other theories, so it's true because of the special structure of the Higgs sector in the standard model. We have one Higgs doublet and uh, the most general potential of this single Higgs doublet. But if you have, for example, two Higgs doublets, then this is different. Different, for example, in the two Higgs doublet model. In the two Higgs doublet model, uh, the vacuum structure could be such that all four generators are broken and therefore the photon is massive or you could have some other structures of the vacuum. But here it is automatic and you cannot avoid um, that uh, there is exactly one massless and three massive gauge bosons. 
And that is of course in agreement with observations again. And it follows accidentally uh, from the standard model structure. Nice. So, okay. Um, any questions? Oh, again. <laughs> Yes. yes, exactly. And what uh, you can now check afterwards is that any other choice would first of all lead to equivalent physics, but you would not have T3 here, but maybe T2 or T1 or some linear combination. Um, but the physics, of course, would be unchanged. You would, it just corresponds to a relabeling of the indices 1, 2, 3 corresponding to SU2. And of course, that doesn't change the ultimate physics. And uh, so, this is a simple exercise. You can easily do it for yourself by saying that whatever that is, uh, as long as it is non-zero, you always get here non-zero and you always get there non-zero and you can plug some values in some general ansatz that it is always possible to find a linear combination of the three TAs and the Y such that it maps any phi min to zero. And then that would be your starting point to define the photon in that context. Then you would have to go back to the previous section where we discussed the photon interactions. That would have to be changed accordingly by again uh, inheriting the relabeling of T123 in an obvious way. But again, the ultimate physics of the photon set W plus minus interactions would be the same. So from this point of view that we show on the standard model now, the requirement for the gate proof would be that um, the generators just form a basis of this 2 by 2 space. Which 2 by 2 space? Uh -huh. and, the, and the y is proportional to the one. Yes. And so they have to form a basis that we can do this trick. Yes. So basically, if, uh, any linear combination that you write down here will be a Hermitian 2 by 2 matrix, because that is the unit matrix. And this is a basis of the traceless uh, Hermitian 2 by 2 matrices. So overall, the four matrices together give you a general basis of the Hermitian 2 by 2 matrices. And then the question is, can you always find a Hermitian 2 by 2 matrix which maps any phi min to zero? And the answer is yes, because you have to choose the columns orthogonal to phi min, and that is obviously possible even for a Hermitian matrix. And, uh, yeah. and so if we expand this the Higgs field to this, and if you choose it to phi min, then we have effectively another gate proof, because this U1 Q is also non Uh, the gauge group is abelian and it would always be a, un, um, uh, 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 sorry, a U1 gauge group because it consists only of one generator. So the Lie algebra consists of one generator and the group elements consist of the matrices you obtain by exponentiating this one generator. So even if it's a non-diagonal matrix, it's still a one parameter Lie group consisting of non-diagonal matrices, but all these non-diagonal matrices would commute with each other and would depend on one common parameter alpha, let's say. So therefore, it's, it's always the same group structure that you obtain. And you could do a basis transformation, which would bring you back to exactly this form. Therefore, the physics of the standard model is universal and does not depend on this particular choice. Nevertheless, we can make the choice in order to make it uh, convenient and easier to understand. It is a convention. But there is one unique physics of the standard model with spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is independent of the conventions you take. And that is that I mean, if the potential has the wine bottle form, you get spontaneous symmetry breaking, you automatically get one unbroken generator, so you get a remnant U1 gauge group, which leaves the vacuum invariant. This gauge group is never just Y or never just T3. It is always a combination of both. 
uh, and you could, by relabeling the indices 1, 2, 3, always bring it to this form T3 plus Y. And how do I understand that this <coughs> um, comes from a massless boson and uh, boson? Yeah, maybe by looking at the next chapter of the lecture. Okay. Should we go to the next chapter of the lecture? Or do we have other questions? But the masses come next. So if your question is ab about the masses, then we should hurry to do the next section. The masses come from the bilinear terms in the gauge and Higgs sector. And let us today evaluate them in unitary gauge, which is uh, extremely simple and straightforward. And afterwards, we will also look at other gauges which are less straightforward, but let's first do the calculation in unitary gauge. And again, I'm sure that you have seen this before. But let's collect all the facts before we do something that you might not know. So we have to work out um, the Lagrangian consisting of um, the latter part of the Higgs and of the Higgs potential, which is this kinetic term minus the Higgs potential. And We do it for fluctuations around the minimum. So we do not evaluate it in full, but we are interested now in small perturbations of the ground state because that corresponds to uh, small excitations and excitations correspond to particles in quantum field theory. So that will describe the particles that we have their properties, in particular their mass. So, uh, and for that we need to introduce a parametrization of the Higgs doublet field. And uh, phi of x will be written in general as follows. G plus of x in the upper component and in the lower component we do V plus H of x plus I times G zero of x divided by square root of 2. We are G plus is complex and V, H and G zero are real quantities. So we parameterize it in this way. The upper component is just left as a complex field as it always was and the lower component is split First the vacuum, the ground state is split off as a constant. Then H corresponds to the fluctuation of the real part around the minimum. And G0 corresponds to the fluctuation of the imaginary part around the minimum. So in the ground state, the fields H and G are zero. And away from the ground state, the fields H and G um, correspond to excitations. So now we go to a gauge fixing and we use this what is called unitary gauge uh, in the vicinity of the minimum we can do always a gauge transformation uh, of the Higgs field such that the Goldstone also this uh, field G plus is gauged away and also the imaginary part can be gauged away plus and G0 can be gauged to zero. And the unitary gauge corresponds to fixing this such that in this unitary gauge our phi of x only looks like this zero in the upper component and V plus H of X over square root of two 
in the lower component. And let us skip the proof. It is not difficult. You just have to look at the form of the gauge transformations to see that whatever value the field G plus or G zero have, you can uh, do a gauge transformation and after the gauge transformation, those two fields are zero. So uh, this is a possible choice of gauge. Afterwards, the theory is not gauge invariant anymore, so you cannot do any more gauge transformations, but it's a gauge fixing, therefore. But in this particular gauge fixing, the physical content of the theory becomes particularly well visible. It's very transparent to see uh, what degrees of freedom are actually described. Of course, the physics is independent of the gauge, but some gauges are easier to analyze than others. So let us use this gauge for analyzing what are the physical states in our theory. Now let us evaluate this. L, uh, in um, or, or, or in bilinear approximation because bilinear uh, terms in the Lagrangian correspond to free field terms and free fields can be quantized and we know uh, what the quantization implies namely particle states, Fox spaces and so that then fixes the interpretation. Okay, so in order to evaluate this, uh, as I said, the first term is this covariant derivative of the Higgs field squared. In order to evaluate the square, we first evaluate the thing itself. And since ultimately we want bilinear terms, we need this only in linear approximation, linear in the fields of the theory. So we evaluate this and drop all terms at the end which contain higher powers than first order in the fields. So what does that mean? First, the normal derivative acting on this here. So the normal derivative acting on V gives zero because V is a constant. Therefore, the only thing that remains is here H divided by square root of two. Then plus i, and I propose that we immediately use the, um, let's say, covariant derivative in terms of the physical fields like the photon and z. Then we have here e times q times the photon times this other strange combination in front of the z, e divided by s theta c theta t3 minus s theta square times Q uh, acting on the Higgs, uh, sorry, times uh, times Z mu, all of this acting on zero V plus H divided by square root of two, and then the W, i times e divided by square root of 2 s theta times and then w plus minus uh, set plugging in the Pauli matrices and we have here w plus mu w minus mu zero acting on this. All right, so if we are only interested in linear terms, uh, in the view of the time, let us really be interested only in the linear terms. Uh, otherwise, we could of course do everything, but if we are interested only in linear terms, then here we have gauge fields. Those are fields and then we can neglect the Higgs field here because Higgs field times gauge field is nonlinear in the fields and so here we have take only the constant. Also here W times Higgs is neglected, we take only the constant and then we obtain the following. So from the first we have zero T mu H divided by square root of two and from the second we have I times the following. Now what is the electric charge applied onto that? 
So the lower component of the Higgs doublet has electric charge zero. Therefore, the electric charge applied onto that gives zero. So that drops out because it has no electric charge. That is the point. The vacuum has no electric charge, right? Therefore, this gives zero and the photon doesn't couple to the background vacuum expectation value. And so here also the electric charge vanishes. That gives minus one half. And then we have just minus E over two S theta C theta times uh, S theta square. Uh, sorry, not, not times this, times Z mu times this. Okay, so that is the Z boson part and then for the W, the W plus does something with this and it raises it into the upper component, uh, this times W plus mu times V divided by square root of 2 and in the lower component we now have 0. Okay, therefore, what happens if we do the square, the absolute value square, and take the bilinear terms? The square is now very easy because, uh, please look at this, we have here something real in the lower component, something completely imaginary in the lower component, and something in the upper component. So the absolute value of the whole thing is the absolute value of the real part square, imaginary part square, upper component square. Sum of three terms. Therefore, let's just write down the three terms. Here the square of this is one half d mu h square, the kinetic term for the Higgs. The square of the second term is the following, absolute value square, so the i and the minus cancels. We have plus e square, divided by 4 um, s square c square times v square times 1 half z mu z mu. That is the second term. And the third term square is here. v e square v square divided by 4 s square times w plus mu w minus mu. And then you see that you can write this as equal to one half d mu h square plus one half m z square times z square plus m w square w plus w minus with mw square is equal to e square divided by times v square divided by 4 s theta square. And so mw square is the prefactor here. And the z mass is the prefactor there. I conveniently already factored out the one half necessary for real fields. And the only difference to the w mass is the factor 1 over c square in the denominator. And so we can write down the ratio mw divided by mz, which is the easiest thing. That is equal to the mixing angle cosine theta. And so uh, let us think whether we can also briefly, uh, let, me, let me do one or two more minutes and We do it here. Uh, I believe you have all already calculated the Higgs potential and the Higgs boson mass in similar ways, right? Therefore, it's probably okay if I simply say uh, similarly B of phi in the unitary gauge can be written as follows. So you can write it as lambda times b times h plus h square over 2 square plus an irrelevant constant which can be dropped. 
And so the bilinear term is then lambda times v square plus h square plus higher orders. And so then let me summarize the result. The bilinear term of the Higgs plus gauge sector in unitary gauge bilinear has the following terms, one half times d mu x square plus mw square w plus w minus plus one half mz square z square minus one half mx square x square with once again mw is equal to e times v divided by 2 as theta, mw divided by mz is equal to cosine theta, and mx square is equal to 2 lambda times v square. And then we have computed all the masses, and the photon, of course, remains massless. And let me just add here the next miracle, namely, not only the photon remains automatically masterless, we have said this already before as the previous miracle, um, but the new miracle here is, what is the new miracle? The new miracle is, of course, uh, CW is equal to C theta, namely, the weak mixing angle defined via the mass ratio is the same as the weak mixing angle defined via gauge couplings and which appears in all the interactions. And that was an observational fact which we wrote down in the beginning this morning and it comes out here at three level automatically from the standard model. And this depends on the Higgs sectoral structure as you see because this comes out of the Higgs sector. And that corresponds to this so-called custodial symmetry, which will be an extra section of the lecture because that is particularly important. So, of course, it can also then change in theories beyond the standard model, which do not share this custodial symmetry, and then in such theories you get a different ratio of the masses between W and Z. And that is actually an exercise for you. On the sheet you will see a few examples how uh, this mass ratio can become different if you change the Higgs sector in some interesting ways. Good. Now we have managed to finish almost on time with everything I plan to do today. Um, and uh, have fun with the exercise sheet and then we will continue next week.